Hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I'm the Social Media Manager for the Space Telescope Science Institute. And today we've got a really interesting topic to talk about. There has been a new discovery of a very unusual asteroid. And uh, with me here to, to talk about it today is uh, Dr. David Jewett from the University uh, or from UCLA. He's a professor there. Um, also with me is uh, Max Mutchler. You guys remember him. He's from the Space Telescope Science Institute. He's also an expert in uh, dealing with Hubble data. And uh, he's also a part of this uh, observing program as well. And to help badger these guys and talk to them about all these in all this interesting science, back with me is Scott Lewis from KnowTheCosmos.com. Hi, Scott. How's it going, Tony? And Dr. Ian O'Neill, the space editor for Discovery News. Hi, Ian. It's good to see you again. Hi, Tony. Thanks for having me on. Okay, so before I get started, let me just say that we are monitoring all of the usual social stuffs. And so is the NSA. And so, Be careful. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Along with the NSA. So wave. Uh, <laughs> Google Plus, we're looking at our event page, we're looking at comments there. I have this really cool, neat little Q&A plug-in daily technical thing they've added that I am monitoring as well. So you can ask your questions and I will select them and we will look at them, uh, talk about them live on here. Also, hashtag Hubble Hangout if you want to use Twitter. And I'm looking at the YouTube comment page as well. That seems to be where we get most of our comments. So well, we're standing by, ready for you to have comments. Uh, we're going to talk about this unusual asteroid today. And then a little bit later on, we may uh, have a few words to say about the latest news uh, from Comet Ison with uh, Dr. Bonnie Meinke from the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. She's going to be joining us a little bit later. So, Dr. Jewett, welcome. Howdy. Hi. So you have discovered something rather unusual. You want to tell us about it? Yeah. So it's an object um, called P2013 P5. Uh, the P means it's a periodic comet, but in fact, it's an asteroid. So if you look at the orbit, it's definitely an asteroid, <coughs> but it looks like a comet. So we used the Space Telescope to uh, have a look and see what's going on with that. And we found um, an appearance unlike any other object, basically. It's kind of a unique thing in the solar system. So uh, quick question here. How did you know, first of all, to look at this thing? I mean, this has got to be very faint in the sky when it was first discovered, right? How, was it, how, would, how did you find it? It's about 20th magnitude, so it's pretty faint. But um, we, didn't find, we didn't discover it. It was discovered by a survey telescope in Hawaii called PanStars that's just looking at you know, bucket loads of sky every night looking for interesting things. Uh, and, and it was announced by them as a comet. Uh, but as I said, the orbit is definitely not a comet orbit. And so that's what triggered uh, our attention. And we got the HST to look at it for that reason. So we didn't discover the thing but we discovered uh, the interesting nature of the thing. Okay, yeah. So this is, as you pointed out, an asteroid, and Max has a, has a screen share of it now, which I'm showing to everybody. You're right. This really does look like a comet. Now, what makes you so sure this is an asteroid? Well, so the answer in part is, what, you know, what's the difference between an asteroid and a comet? And there, there are different ways of defining those bodies. But basically, the dynamical one comes down to looking at the way they interact with Jupiter. So there's a number called the Tisserand parameter that nobody cares about except that the value of this number uh, indicates clearly this is just like an asteroid. The, the better way to say that is if you plot a whole bunch of asteroids on a diagram, like distance from the sun versus the eccentricity or something, this object is just one of those bodies. You can't pick this object out in any way. It's an absolutely typical asteroid uh, in terms of its orbit. So there's nothing special about it at all. It's sitting at the inner edge of the asteroid belt. It's uh, two AUs from the sun. The orbit is basically a circle, and it's slightly tilted relative to the Earth's orbit plane, but not a hell of a lot. There's nothing special about this. There are, there are you know, hundreds or thousands of asteroids just like this one. So we, uh, we've we only recently found it because of the PanStar survey, and as Max is showing now, he's got this orbit going back and forth of the, uh, of the regular sort of circular nature of this thing. So we, this is how, is this one way in which it's distinguished uh, between, say, something like Comet Ison, which may be one of those, you know, outer solar system objects? Well, the, the comets come from a different place. So they come from far out in the Kuiper Belt beyond Neptune, or maybe the Oort cloud, in the case of Ison, you know, out right, right. What, 50, 50, one fifth of the way to the stars. So they tend to have very elliptical, skinny orbits that dip into the planetary system. 
Uh, but the asteroids are, are essentially between Mars and Jupiter in nearly circular orbits. So it's quite a dramatic difference. There's no doubt about the fact that this thing is dynamically an asteroid. Uh, and yet it looks physically like a comet. It's losing stuff. Asteroids should just be a rock. You know, it should just look like a point in a, in a telescopic picture. So what's going uh, on here? What, what, why does it look this way then? That's, that's the whole question. Why is it losing dust? That's the question. And we don't um, have no answers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing dead silence here. Uh, well, I just I thought it's good to put in a so, so it's not space pause. Can we rule out space unicorns? <laughs> <laughs> well, you saw the Tony. You saw the language yeah, used in the press release. Um, yeah. Words like uh, we were dumbfounded. It was freakish. It was weird. And we were even uh, you know even just the day before the press release, we were kind of amongst ourselves you know wondering whether we were using too many superlatives. You know, but the fact is that that was our reaction. Is you know, we've, we're people who've looked at a lot of images like this, and none of us have ever seen anything quite like this. So there is a precedent for these kinds of objects, though. Uh, like we were talking about it before the hangout started, Max, about this X marks the spot uh, uh, asteroid. You don't happen to have the graphic of that by any chance, handy, do you? Yeah. Oh, great! If you could, if you could put that up real quick, um, this asteroid that Max is. Uh, screen sharing with us now is an asteroid back that was discovered back in 2010 and does look similar at least to the one that uh, Dr. Jewett was just talking about but we know why this one looks the way it does correct we think we think we might have uh, some decent ideas about that so there are actually 10 of these things so it's a, a class called the first of all we call them the main belt comets now we call them active asteroids, but they're the same thing. So we, we found them. Uh, my grad student, Henry Shea, and I announced this as a group in 2006. Uh, but it's a pretty weird group because most of the members of this group look different. They're all, they're all asteroids by their orbits, but comets by their physical appearances. And you said so, th this is a class that you helped develop, you, you categorized. Yeah, I, I, I discovered this class of bodies. Uh, but but the deal is uh, P5. I'll just call this one P5. P5 is like so weird, even by the standards of this class of weird objects, that that we're still bat struggling to get to grips with this thing. So the deal is the others. You said um, the one that's being shown now, A2, looks like P5. Actually, it doesn't. I mean, it looks like it in the sense. Well, I mean, got, it was similar. It had similar. It, it had yeah, a tail. Okay, but to the comet <laughs> Fusado, totally different, man. You know, so it's got it's got dust coming out of it, but P5 has got six tails, which is like totally stupid. So normally comets have uh, a, a dust tail and a gas tail. So if you look at the best pictures of comet Ison now, you can see two tails, and that's what they've got, and they go off in the same direction. What we saw with this object is six tails. They're all dust tails, and they all go off in different directions, and those directions splay around on the sky. They, they sweep around dramatically between our first look with HST, uh, which was on the 10th of September, and the second one, uh, 13 days later. So it's the six tails, the thin, narrow, straight tails, and the fact that they're, they're swishing around on the sky that uh, astonished us. So the other objects in this class don't look like that. And if you could put a was it a five back up or a a two a two a two uh, back up that one uh, the reason I say we we think we know why it has that tail there's a there's a uh, this was probably the result of a collision with another asteroid correct that's that's what we think okay yeah. so and that X there that that one part that there's a, a feature in there a structure mean, in there you mean the the Klingon spaceship. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I thought it was a Romulan. Is that oh, oh, okay, Romulan, whatever. Okay, all right. <laughs> right. That is the um, that is the point at which the uh, one of the features left over from the uh, collision itself. So, um, in that yeah, in that model, and it's just a model. In that model, that those that X model. structure is uh, like a trail of uh, debris, big boulders. Uh, which are themselves sources of dust. So right. you can see they're releasing that uh, long trail that you see going down to the lower right. So these 
this asteroid, P5, the one that we were talking about today, um, yeah. has all of these tails. Max, there was a, a schematic done by Ann Field. Do you have that handy? Because if you don't, I do. Um, and I can show that um, where she showed the... Um, uh, For which one? I got it right here. That's okay. I can show it. It's... Um, so here's a schematic that was done uh, by Ann Field at the Institute that sort of draws a little bit clearer the locations of the uh, of the different tails. And you can see that the, the asteroids at the top there, and then you have these six sort of trailing things that are that are going out going out behind it. And I, I guess one of the things that so that I want to highlight here about this whole entire discussion is that one of the things that I learned the hard way with the Comet Ison hangouts and the discussions that we've been having is that you know there's 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 a lot of uh, uh, I guess concern that when scientists see something with Hubble that they don't fully understand that there's some uh, there's some mechanism for wanting to just sort of hide it and and sort of cover it up uh, and not talk about it if we see features we can't explain then I think we do a pretty good job of saying we don't understand that and this discovery folks is an ex is an excellent example of that because we I mean you just heard dr. Jewett say we don't know why this is the way it is we know they don't it's it's unusual. It's strange. It's freakish, um, and they don't know why it's uh, why it is the way it is. It's but that does not mean we don't know. Therefore, aliens. So right. I, YouTube. <laughs> don't. Yeah, that's it's that's the way to think about these discoveries in particular. Because of course, with the um, the previous one, I think it was uh, the one that was like the Romulan spacecraft that didn't really. I mean, people obviously drew the comparison, but because I think the Hubble you guys were so open with it they're saying you know we don't really know what it is we're investigating it's very cool very interesting it yeah you had the low level conspiracy theories but <laughs> but for some reason it didn't actually catch fire and I think it's because you guys just said look we don't know what it is we are investigating it's very cool and it could be this and I think by doing science that way actually um, is better than uh, they're not talking about it because otherwise that's where the conspiracy theories come in. Well, and that's where that's what's so exciting about it. Is this yeah. that we don't know and science. we get to yeah. look like let's use this amazing tool called science and figure out what's going on. That's the whole point of it all. Well, Tony, so you, you, you yeah. probably remember the Heaven's Gate business with Hale Bopp uh, many years oh, yes. ago. Yeah. So, so somebody etched a fake uh, co-moving object with Comet Hale Bopp, and this was interpreted by a cult in Southern California as a sign of some alien spaceship coming back to destroy the Earth. So a bunch of guys um, uh, poisoned themselves to death in a house near San Diego. So I was with A2. I was actually scared that you know people were saying it looks like a, um, a spaceship coming along. People, I was I was scared that people might do the same thing with P5. Uh, and, or with A2? No, with A2. Oh, okay. And please, though, they didn't. Yes, yes. And so, but so here actually, you... let's change it. It's a Vulcan spacecraft now, so they're not trying to kill us. They're just making first contact, so don't worry. There's no okay. need to do anything. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, I, I, but I do want to make, I think, the rather serious point here that, you know, this is an example, folks, of, of an, of, of scientists looking at something with the Hubble Space Telescope and not fully understanding what it is and saying so. Okay. There's no. There's no. Um, like with with the other things that we were, we were we've been talking about. There's not an attempt to just because we don't understand it, cover it up, or if there's a jet, hide the jet, or whatever it is. Right. There's just no. There's no reason to do that. In fact, it, people's reputations are on the line here. People's uh, scientific. Uh, uh, careers are on the line if they if they try to do something like that like hiding it or m mislead so it's important to say what is really going on now uh, dr. Jewett you you um, you're pretty sure this is not the result these tales of a collision with another object what makes you say that yeah so it's you know although we don't know what it is what's causing it we have ideas about what it could be we have speculation and we know some things that it's very unlikely to be so um, the first idea was maybe it's ice. Maybe it's like a real icy comet and it's sublimating. The trouble is that in its present orbit, it's quite hot and the ice would only last a very short time. So it should have sublimated away long could ago. You, 
Could you explain yeah. for our viewers what sublimate means? I know we Sub understand, but Sub what sublimate Sub means? Sublimate is like evaporate. So in, in space where there's no atmosphere, um, you can't have any liquid. So if you heat up ice, instead of turning into a liquid and then turning into steam, it goes straight to steam, straight to a vapor. And there's no liquid phase. So sublimate means from solid to gas. So that's what comets do because there's no atmosphere, there's no pressure. Um, but, you know, it's, it's basically too hot to be icy. And why would sublimating ice give you six tails anyway? It doesn't really make any sense. Other comets don't have six tails. Uh, and we know they're made of sublimating ice, so it doesn't sound right. Uh, so we reject that. And then collision is the other possibility. Collision, as you said, is a good idea for A2. Uh, but what uh, my collaborator Jessica Agarwald in uh, Germany figured out is that the six tails of P5 were emitted at six distinct times over a five-month period. Now, if you had an impact, the impact would go bang and produce a massive uh, shower of debris, but just once. It would all come out at the same time. And you'd have one fat tail that would go off. You wouldn't have six uh, thin tails with different ages. So we can rule out impact as well. So did you have a question? Stay no, go ahead. I, I was just going to wait for you to well, finish. It's just, just by elimination, we, we kind of came to the idea that maybe this is a body that's rotationally unstable. So maybe um, its uh, rotation rate has been spun up um, uh, to the point where material on the equator is unstable, just about to fly off. And so the, I think of like little mini avalanches of material uh, rolling across the surface of this rapidly spinning nucleus. And at the equator, they can fall off, and radiation pressure picks them up and makes a tail. So it's so, like if you, get a, if you get a tray of sand, here's the very graphic picture. If you get a tray of sand and you tilt it up, eventually you know all the sand is going to avalanche down to the ground. But before it goes, if you look at the surface carefully, there are little unstable patches, little micro avalanches begin to roll down the surface uh, of the tilted sand pile. That's what I think is happening on the surface of this body. So things coming from the poles of the spitting rock are going down and, and being flung out in all kinds of different directions then? Yeah. Okay. So what do you, how would you explain the, the, the pattern here, the, the six rays sort of coming out? That seems kind of orderly in terms of, you know, if it were just a bunch of stuff being spewed out from a spinning body, wouldn't you get more of a, I don't know, a, a spiral or something? Or would, why are we seeing these sort of ray-like so structures? Each, um, again, that's Jessica. So each, okay. who's, who's not in this hangout, I think, this, each, right. tail, <coughs> each tail corresponds to a little micro avalanche. It's maybe... You know, a few tens or a hundred tons of dust, excuse me, that fell off the nucleus because it's rotating so fast. And then it's picked up by radiation pressure from the sun, and that spreads it out by size. So the small dust particles are accelerated quickly, and the big guys hang around, they're traveling more slowly. So radiation pressure makes a straight line, and the direction of the straight line depends on the instant when the dust is ejected. So the first little microavalanche makes one tail, and then radiation pressure goes whoosh and, and straightens it out into a, into a dust tail. And then later on, you know, several weeks or a month or two later, another avalanche goes off in a different direction because uh, the object is rotated around the sun and that direction is now uh, changed. So each, each one is a different age. So the one, the one that's about the um, uh, three, or f three or four o'clock position is the oldest tail. That's five months old. And the one that's about 7.30 or 8 o'clock is uh, the youngest one. That was just um, a week old or something when we took that picture on the left. Awesome. So here we're looking at the, the, the actual observations that were taken. One was taken on September 10th, and the other one was taken uh, 10 days later. Uh, I, and well, I think it was 10 days. What was it? What, it's 13, been obscured. 13, 13, 13 days. Sorry, the yeah. date's obscured on my, on my uh, image here. Uh, and it looks like it's kind of flipped. And so this is what led you to think that this thing was spinning, correct? Uh, nope, that's no? that's what that's what totally freaked us out. So the fact oh. <laughs> the fact that the we had no idea what the second picture was going to look like, frankly. So we're sitting there, you know, scratching our heads, biting our nails, thinking what's what's going to happen. And the second picture came up, and at first we didn't notice that we can see all of the six tails from the from the September 10 picture in the September 23 picture. But after a few days or a week or something, we figured out that yeah, we can actually see them. They just changed. Some of them are now really faint. Others got brighter, but they're all there, and they've all rotated. 
and that was the clue. Then Jessica was able to show that the rotation for all the tails is explained by what's called the synchrone model. So each tail it consists of a bunch of dust particles released at one time. But the times are different for the different tails. Nice. So each one, you're looking at six different events uh, occurring, and they're all being spread and kind of sorted by radiation pressure into by size, uh, and uh, into these into these uh, neat little rays. That is so cool. Yeah, Max, exactly. can you comment a little? Did you process much of the the, the these images here, or did you yeah. have much of a role in that? Yeah, that's that's my main role. Is, okay. Uh, and I could, I, we could look at that a little bit. Uh, one thing I was, I was wanted to comment on, and, and Dave, you could correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you know, as you heard Dave mention, that the driving force here is sunlight, which is kind of, almost seems counterintuitive in a way. Um, you know, there's been this idea for a long time, uh, the idea of the Yarkovsky effect or the Yorp effect, that sunlight, you know, can spin up irregularly shaped objects. You know, and, and in this case, spinning it so fast that it starts, you know, losing material. And I don't recall a better, you know, this, to me, this object suddenly becomes the poster child for the Yarkovsky effect. I can't think of a better, more textbook example. I don't know, am I forgetting something, Dave, or? <laughs> well, you know, the, um, one thing. So, you know, when, when people are experts in the subject, they show their expertise by, by throwing in more specialist names. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so Yarkovsky refers to uh, radiation uh, pushing the asteroid, pushing the asteroid around. So changing its orbit, uh, but it can also change the spin, and that's what we're interested in. So those guys have a different name for that. They call that the YORP effect. Y O R P. Uh, it's the same damn thing, but it's got a different name. So if you want to be hip and trendy, you have to call it the YORP effect. It's a, <laughs> it's a, cha a change. A <laughs> change. I'm definitely hip and trendy. Yeah. It's a talk. It's a talk. Um, a talk on a body exerted by light. And uh, like I said, I this is a pretty pretty textbook example of it. I mean, it's. Uh, I hope so. I mean, it's, you know, it sure looks like that to me. But we, you know, we have more data planned, so that ought to tighten the tighten the noose, so to speak. And oh well, let's talk about that. What what do you have more observations coming up then? Yeah, we have observations until February, uh, roughly once a month. And so the idea is just to look. Since we've never seen anything like this, we were able to. Um, convince the uh, director of Space Telescope to give us some time to just have a look and see what's going on. So we don't have um, any, when we wrote the proposal, we didn't have any strong model to test. We just said this is so special, you know, it absolutely deserves to be watched to see what we can learn from it. And, and the operation works well enough that we got that time. Well, well, what is it you're actually going to be specifically looking for um, to prove or disprove if it is the Yorp effect which is actually um, creating this spin? Well, is there some sort of telltale sign you're looking for? For, for example, this, this thing I was mentioning, um, Jessica's model about the radiation pressure sorting of the tails. So that makes very specific predictions for the angles of the tails as a function of time. So. The paper that we, we put out last week or whenever it was uh, is based on just two visits with Space Telescope. So we're fitting lines through two points, basically. They're curved, they're not straight lines, they're curved lines. So it's a good fit, we think. But from the subsequent visits, we'll be able to see, you know, how good are those predictions uh, of the model? And do the tails continue to swing around in the way that that model suggests? So if they don't, we'll probably have to uh, modify or abandon the model, depending on what we see. And if they continue to move in the expected way, then we would pat ourselves on the heads and say, hey, great model. <laughs> Good question, Ian. OK, so Max, let's talk a little bit about the data, the, the, the data themselves that uh, Hubble took of, uh, of P5. Um, we're with with Ison, the last Hubble image of Ison, we had a problem in that we only had one orbit with two images. There were some artifacts that we couldn't get out. Was that a problem here with uh, with this with this data? Not really. I mean, you know, with these observations, and I'll show it in a second. You know, the data is quite messy when it comes down, as we've discussed in previous Hangouts. Sure. And, uh, yeah. Which also gets to the point of why you know scientists tend to be quite conservative. I mean, we usually give ourselves a fair amount of time to make sure we're not fooling ourselves. And actually, with these images, I mean, there, um, you know, there are a lot of artifacts in here which could could look like a, a tail coming out of uh, the asteroid, and and so I'm just going to blink back and forth here between the uh, I don't know if you're displaying my screen, my screen. Yep, screen. I am. I, I've got you up. 
But you know, again, you know, just to show the before and the after, like what comes down is loaded with cosmic rays. I'm actually going to zoom out a little bit here too. So you see a lot of cosmic rays here that I'm cleaning that I clean out. There's also sort of a dotted line, like a U, um, kind of beneath the the uh, object here. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit more, and you'll see even more of that stuff. You'll see that it's actually a very small object in a very large frame. And uh, wow, look at that! A little while, you know, it takes a little while. You can see that it's not even the brightest thing in there. You see all these dotted lines are background stars that you know, as we're tracking this object, um, background stars are not moving, so uh, as we take a series of exposure, each background star becomes a dotted line. So and, that's what uh, you're seeing there in the lower left. You're seeing a bunch of the, that, that hash mark line is, is a star that right, was being trailed here. during the exposure. Right, so a very bright star, which fortunately didn't get any closer um, and didn't run right over, you know, right, right on top of our object. You see many fainter ones around as well, dotted lines, so various stars and galaxies, lots of cosmic rays, so it's quite messy, and uh, you could imagine how, you know, at first glance, it, it might obscure. You might think that these interesting tails are really just some artifact like that, and only after we clean it up. So now I'll just kind of blink back and forth. Again, the before and after, we get all those star trails. So it is kind of a needle in a haystack problem, and you want to convince yourself that, you know, that this is real, that these, these tails are really associated with the asteroid and not just some, you know, insidious combination of artifacts tricking our eyes. But I can tell you that even with the first frames before we clean them out, I mean, we get several exposures in a row, and you could see that these these trails were being uh, consistently detected, so that they, they weren't random artifacts like all the other things that we clean out of the image. So pretty excited right away. And as you can see here, we're really not, I mean, we got enough exposure that we could really clean up the image quite well. And Do you remember how, much, how many exposures you were able to get? I think in this initial one, we got something like five exposures in an orbit, and that's pretty good. Um, yeah. All the same filters, so we don't ha we didn't get any color information. Uh, we're starting to get some now in some of our later observations. So even though I'm showing it on a blue uh, color scale here, it's really uh, I probably should show it as gray because we don't really have any color information, just brightness here. But, and so, uh, what, what do you know the filter? What filter was it observed? Yeah, in? this is the broadest filter we have. It's called F three fifty LP, and the LP is for low pass and uh, so basically it's almost like a clear filter it, it just lets most of the light through you know that, that the telescope can collect whereas most filters um, of course only allow a narrow you know uh, uh, you know set of wavelengths of light through uh, to isolate certain wavelengths certain colors certain spectral features things like that but in this case in this case we're just trying to detect this thing it's it's very faint and the tail is even fainter and so we just want to sell out for detecting all the faintest features we can at this point. Yeah, so a um, couple quick, I, we, I don't remember if you addressed this already yet, Dr. Jewett, or not, but uh, the, um, uh, the size of this thing, did you tell us how big it was? Um, not today, no. But okay, but how from, big is this from, thing? From the brightness of the nucleus, we know that, uh, that it's not bigger than about uh, 250 meters in radius. So it's actually pretty oh, wow. small. That is pretty small. Mm. But uh, it could be a lot smaller than that. So what we don't know is how much dust, because you know we have a finite resolution, even with space telescope, uh, we have small small pixels, but they're still you know 100 kilometers or something at the object. We don't know how much dust is in those central pixels, and so it's really an upper limit to the size, and it could be substantially smaller even than that. So it's a really tiny body by the standards of most things that have been observed in the asteroid belt. And that's important because this mechanism for, for spinning up a body by radiation forces, the Yorp mechanism, only really works on tiny bodies because radi radiation is, uh, the torque is so weak. I mean, you can't change the spin of the Earth because the Earth is so, so big, you ne it just will never change no matter how much sunlight you shine on it. But for a sub-kilometer body, um, the spin-up time is thought to be less than a million years, which is pretty short in terms of the age of the solar system. So that also hangs together. I mean, that fits our, our general picture, uh, that this is a body that is small enough for its spin to be changed by radiation forces. Doesn't mean it didn't happen, but it's consistent. Okay. Now you mentioned earlier at the top of the show that you were uh, that this is a this is in a circular orbit or roughly circular orbit uh, in between Mars and Jupiter. So wh this would imply to me that this really isn't much of a threat uh, to the Earth, then, right? Unless something unless something I gotta ask. <laughs> I know, but I gotta ask. Uh -huh. uh, 
So the, the ch unless it gets perturbed somehow by something big, this is going to pretty much stay where it is, right? Yeah, it's probably and, it's probably been there for you know lo longer than uh, the age of the dinosaurs. I mean, it's nothing has happened to this thing. It's so far away. Forget it. Okay, and you mentioned also that it was 20th magnitude, I believe, so it's pretty faint. Um, that puts yeah. it out of reach, doesn't it, for, I don't think many amateurs are going to be able to see this. That that well, actually, there, saw it. yeah, and there's, there's a bunch of amateur astronomers who do fantastically good observing, actually. They can go really uh, okay, significantly, they, okay. they can go deeper than that. But um, the deal is that those tails are extremely faint. So although the nucleus part is 20th or 21st now, I think it is, the tails are really, really faint. And so I looked at this thing with um, Keck, and the Keck telescope failed to show what we see in the HST data. So that's a measure of how tough it is to see those tails. So I think amateur astronomers can take and have taken uh, pictures that show the object and show that it's uh, comet-like as opposed to just a point source like an asteroid. But I haven't seen any ground-based uh, images, including my own, that show six tails. Okay, so you could probably get some time lapse or something of the thing going across the background stars, uh, but is that's about it? That, that you're going to be seeing the nucleus at best. It sounds you like see, you see the nucleus, and you probably see the brightest tail, and you won't resolve the six tails because they're too faint in the in the ground-based data. So again, that one of the criticisms that we've heard with the Hubble Space Telescope with imaging ISON was that why we can look at the nose hairs of Martians, but we can't get more detail out of the comet. And here's an example, again, of being able to do better than any other telescope at finding detail uh, at some of these objects. And I, so, I missed those observations. When was the nose hairs of Martians? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I did not get that press release. Put yeah. them on the web. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but here again is another example of uh, uh, being able to do this better than, say, even ground-based telescopes. Although uh, the uh, the resolution of these these uh, uh, the the the, f the fuzziness of these objects lends itself only to so much detail. If there is detail that can be resolved by the Hubble, you 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 will see it. And this is a good example of, of these tails are a good example of that. So I wanted to also point that out. Um, so this week, uh, Max, uh, just real briefly, I want to talk a little bit about um, this idea of target of opportunity. You you said that, um, uh, that it, 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 there's several there's several ways to get time on Hubble and to get a, an observation uh, with Hubble done. And one of them is you do a proposal. The time allocation committee looks at it. They they approve your proposal, and sometime in that cycle, you get a you get the number of orbits that you're assigned. But there's this other thing called target of opportunity, which is how this was observed. Can you tell us a little bit about how that works? Yeah, so there's a couple different proposal types that you mentioned. The first one that we did, A2, the X marks the spot, was a director's discretionary where this object was discovered, and I think Dave was interested in observing it with Hubble and uh, reached out to Hal Weaver and myself, who, who have a lot of experience you know, observing these kind of things. And so that was a director's discretionary because it happened in the middle of the year, well away from our, our, our time allocation committee meeting. And... Uh, so, you know, it got approved, but it does take a few weeks for that to get approved. And so I think it was actually John Grunsfeld, who was here at the time, who said, you know, you guys should really submit a target of opportunity. And the difference there is that you submit it uh, not knowing, you know, that an object will be discovered, but you, you submit it, it gets reviewed by the TAC. We'd already had this interesting observation. So it got approved. Um, and then we did observe uh, another one that year. I believe that was the year we observed Sheila, another uh, main belt comet that turned out to be a collision. Um, and we submitted another one after that, and uh, and then it's interesting because as, as as recently as last late spring or, or summer, we were lamenting the fact that our current target of opportunity looked like it looked like nothing was going to happen. We'd been getting roughly one a year, and we'd assume that maybe we're going to continue getting one good one a year. And here, our year was about to expire, and we didn't have anything. Little did we know that you know we were just about to to get on a roll here this summer. So. Uh, not only this one came along, but another one, and now we've got another one in the pipe. So we're we're suddenly as busy as we could imagine. Uh, after you know, wondering if our target of opportunity was going to expire without you know going unused. But um, so the and you know the idea there is that we it's pre-approved. Even though the object doesn't exist yet, we uh, all we have to do is punch in the coordinates, you know, the orbital elements, and uh, and and tweak the final observing. And then we can generally get on it faster because when you discover, you know, when these things are discovered by Pan Stars or Catalina or somebody else, 
Um, you want to get on it as fast as possible. We don't know how long lived these, these events are going to be. Some of them might be quite fleeting. It might be over in a week and a half. Others might unfold over six months. So in the case of a target of opportunity, we were able to get observing it within you know, a week and a half or two weeks instead of uh, three or four weeks uh, when we were operating with a DD proposal. So we got on it a little bit faster. And as you can see, a lot of the good stuff is happening early on, and, and it tends to either dissipate or the target sort of gets away from us as we're both racing around the sun, you know, with us on the inside track, the distance can get larger. So it has allowed us to get on these objects much faster. Yeah, thank you for that. I want I I I find it I one of the things I want to give you guys is more of a, a a look at behind the scenes of what happens with Hubble and how it gets allocated because it is one of the most in demand scientific instruments of, of on the planet Earth and or over the planet Earth and it's um, the way in which people decide what it looks at uh, it is is a very uh, uh, a sort of behind the scenes look at how science is done and so this is one of those ways in which Hubble can remain agile without being locked into well we can't look at this really cool thing that's happening right now because we've got all these other things going on tough it's gonna be gone we have a way of capturing that and I just wanted to bring that out and show could it to it, you could I just say something about DD time directors discretionary time yeah, start by explaining what it is <laughs> uh, Yeah. so if you have an emergency observation something that you couldn't write a proposal to do, you can basically make an appeal uh, to the director of the Space Telescope. So I, I'm sure it doesn't go actually to the director. It probably goes to a committee of people who then make a recommendation. But there's a way to get time directly from some number of orbits held back by the director. So what I wanted to say about that is that is absolutely fantastic. So I, I think that um, there should be you know five times more director's discretionary time than there is. Because I think that probably, in terms of discovery space, DD time is much more important than the regularly allocated time. And the reason is what you see all through science, that, that committees of your peers tend to be ultra-conservative. And so they tend to like to award time for measurements that are guaranteed to give you something that you expect. And so revolutionary science and discoveries actually are downplayed by many of the mechanisms that are used uh, to allocate money for proposals and observing time, not just space telescope, but all telescopes. So DD time cuts, cuts all that out, and you could just make a straight appeal based on the incredible thing that you just realized um, to get a new observation. So that's very exciting, and I think is very productive. And instead of, instead of getting observing time you know, to do something that was interesting to you, a year ago, you can act on something that just came up. So well, I think really, it really, really appeals important. to your your imagination and curiosity of like, ooh, look, I found something amazing. Well, here, sign this in triplicate, bury it for a while. We're going to send this off to committee, and by the time it comes back, you can't observe it anymore. So having that ability to find something amazing and point one of the best observatories that, that man's ever made at it and find out what's going on, that's a huge part of why we're able to discover the things that we do. Yeah, so it's, re it's really important. So yeah, I it's especially, uh, I just like to say it's especially important for solar system science. I mean, obviously Hubble is a general observatory that studies, you know, everything in the universe. But, uh, you know, in, in planetary science, there's a lot of transient objects that could not have been predicted in advance, and we don't know when they're going to show up or when some event or a collision or, you know, whatever is going to happen. And so our ability to do good planetary science with Hubble is, is, is really uh, quite dependent on the, on the DD program. I would say clearly much more so than most other types of astronomy that we do with Hubble. Yep. Before we leave this topic, so then I just have to ask you guys, does that mean that you're suggesting that, or would you say that the actual discoveries that Hubble makes are probably do happen more in this DD time, this, this director's discretionary time, than it would in the planned out proposals? Yeah, I think so. In terms of amount of time allocated per unit, you know, new new finding, new result uh, with some importance, I think so, yeah. Because a lot of science, uh, and again, it's not just directed to space telescope, but a lot of science kind of settles down into refinement. So there's a discovery, and then the next person to come through does it again and makes it, you know, 50% better, and then 20%, then the errors shrink down 10, 5, 1%. It's in that direction, but it's, it's kind of refining the picture and making it more and more and more accurate. At some level, you know, there's no point 
because you don't really learn more by, by going to extreme accuracy um, in many problems. In astronomy, certainly that's the case. So maintaining a significant discovery space, anyway, is very, very important. I think Hubble does that best through the DD time allocations. Awesome. Well, thank you for that great discussion. I really wanted to get that out there. Uh, uh, we'll be talking more about how Hubble uh, looks at things and who decides what and how with, uh, with the Frontier Field stuff that we're doing as well, but this is a good discussion on that. So before we get to questions, I want to welcome Bonnie Meinke from the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, Tony. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, so Bonnie. I I invited Bonnie to talk to us a little bit about Comet Ison because there's been some news in that today, some some movement on that. Bonnie, you, do you want to make a couple of comments on that? Yeah, so things are are heating up, uh, pun intended. And <laughs> Very nice. There, I approve. There, there's some cool things happening. So uh, I want to get to first of all mention that uh, a lot of observatories all around the solar system are observing <laughs> Ison and. Just the other day, Messenger, uh, November 9th through 11th, they that's observed... That's the uh, spacecraft around uh, Mercury, right? <laughs> yes, that's the spacecraft around Mercury. Messenger observed ISON, and I have their image of that right here, if I can... Well, I don't Max think has, I've seen this yet. Sure. Max has something up. What do you... Oh, maybe he does. Oh, uh, I was just no, uh, yeah showing... Uh, uh, there was a NASA science uh, news thing that came out today written by Matthew Knight. Just uh, talking about the brightening, you know, that that's oh, been okay. seen. Oh, okay. Okay. Let me go to this. All right. Can everybody see this now? Uh, let me make you big. Yes. Okay. okay. So they were able to observe both Comet Ison, which is on the right, um, and it, the comet itself is denoted by the little yellow brackets. Right in the center um, there in the middle panel. Right, so they saw Comet Ison. They also saw Comet Enki at the same time. Comet Enki is a periodic comet, and uh, it has a perihelion, uh, comes closest to the sun on November 21st. So we have these two comets coming into the inner solar system uh, close to the sun at about the same time. I'm going to need to start installing traffic lights or something. <laughs> well, I, I would like to mention, because I've gotten this question a couple of times, um, want to mention that... Sorry, let me turn off screen share. Okay. Um, there's not a whole lot more comets suddenly. Nothing has changed. Um, it's just a matter of us being able to observe comets better. Um, we're getting better telescopes, better technology, and we're turning our attention to these sorts of objects. So they're making the news more often. And it seems like there's a sudden influx of comets, but there really isn't. I, I think it's a, it's a great point to make because there's been a lot of comments on that, but I think a great um, way of saying that is after the Chelyabinsk meteorite landed, do you remember how many times the days after people were like, oh, there's fla there's flashes in the sky? Like, yeah, because you're looking up now. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're seeing them. You're looking and you're going to be seeing them because they're happening all the time. You've just been looking down at your smartphone the entire time. Bit of an observation <laughs> bias going on there. <laughs> yeah, if you're if you're looking, you're going to find them because they are happening. And I think this is a great point. Now that we have these amazing tools, we do have people looking. You know, you hear these great comments coming through. People are going to continue to look for them. They're going to find them because they've been there the entire time. <laughs> so, Bonnie, the the, the image you sh you showed of uh, with from, that was from Messenger, correct? Those ones that yeah. one you just had up. Uh, uh, why was it able to image it and nothing around Mars was? Um, I think part of that is it's it's a little bit closer to, to Mercury than Ison was to Mars. It's also closer in, so Ison's brighter now. And those are my two guesses. I, yeah. I don't really know. And, and I asked Frank uh, Summers this question too, or at least not, not about Messenger, but about why Mars uh, wasn't able to see it yesterday. And basically, it's the cameras weren't, uh, they were more designed for looking at very bright things on the surface of Mars than they were looking for things out in space, fuzzy objects out in space. And so, pointing, camera resolution, CCD uh, pixel scale, a lot of that was uh, problematic uh, for being able to image it with Mars. And so, that's why it wasn't really done as much there. Right. Um, yeah. Same, same reason here as well. I mean, we're taking an instrument that wasn't designed to do this type of observation. But we're, we're just taking advantage of the fact that it's where it is and it can look right now. Uh, so, you know, use what you got. 
So we've got a blog on, on ISIN that Bonnie contributes to, as well as myself and Max, and, and uh, uh, we're going to have a post on this a little bit later today. I don't think it's up yet. It wasn't the last time I looked, but something happened uh, recently. It's getting, uh, it's getting brighter, right? Right. Over the last two nights, it's gotten considerably brighter. Uh, by some estimates, a factor of three brighter, by some estimates, a factor of ten. Uh, and that's bringing it closer to this naked eye visibility threshold. Um, so it's, it's getting close. You can, pro you can see it with binoculars now, and in the next couple of days, it may be visible with the naked eye. Awesome. So that's really cool. So uh, naked eye visibility is generally around magnitude 6, but that's you got to be in a pretty dark sky to really see much there in my experience at that magnitude. But uh, hopefully, if you got dark skies, you'll be able to see it in the next few days or so. Um, I also want to point out, and I mentioned this uh, yesterday, but I'll do it again, uh, NASA Goddard is going to have on Thanksgiving Day uh, Google Hangout uh, on air with, uh, with and they're going to have the Solar Dynamics Observatory team on hand as the uh, comet approaches perihelion and they're going to have live well by live that, that is you know it'll be delayed I think 15 minutes or something like that which to me is amazing that they can get data down that quickly uh, from S from the Solar Dynamics Observatory SDO it's this amazing observatory that is looking at the Sun in all sorts of high resolution cameras and all kinds of wavelengths and so uh, I would highly encourage you on Thanksgiving Day to give up some football and check it out because it'll be a lot of fun to to see that um, or so, hand egg for the rest of the people in the world we're talking about the brown hand egg thing not football football oh right that's right that's yeah. the Americans that America <laughs> so so Bonnie you highlighted something very I want to make sure we we we, we plug on a little bit more, and that is these other observatories. Lots of people all over the world are watching it, uh, as well as uh, other observatories. Um, are amateurs making much of a contribution here as well, in terms oh, of the yeah. actual science amateurs. being done? Definitely. Amateurs are making huge contributions. Um, Not the least of which is discovering it. <laughs> well, uh, and, you know, they, they the first, uh, amateur had the first recovery image after it came. Uh, we came out from where we couldn't, we were blocked by the sun. Uh, they're doing some fantastic stuff right now. Awesome. And, and on that topic, Max and I were also talking about this a little bit before the Hangout began. And I asked him, I said, look, if an amateur did something like this with, with Comet Ison, what is the most direct path for getting Hubble to notice it? Is there a way that amateurs can interact in, in a way that, would, that might result in some science observations from Hubble? And Max, you want to comment on that just very briefly, what you said? Yeah, there's just a number of ways that people can announce a discovery, and uh, you know the the uh, Minor Planet Center, the, the IAU can send out the, you know the, their uh, telegrams, their uh, things like that. Um, a lot of times, there's just so much now. Now with all the social media, there's often so much buzz on Twitter and Facebook and everything that often you know it might bubble to the surface quicker via social media these days. Um, but again. Uh, also, there's often a target of opportunity proposal uh, for, for a new comet sitting, you know, that gets approved every year as well. So um, that just waiting for some, probably some amateur who's going to report somewhere that a new comet has been discovered and then, you know, somebody's going to pounce on it with Hubble. It's a golden age, not just for professional astronomers with all of these wavelengths and infrared and Hubble and the upcoming JWST and, and things like that, but for amateurs as well. Uh, prof professional grade equipment is available to people uh, who can even, you know, look in the IR. There's even ways of getting some sort of. Um, uh, uh, I don't want to call it direct. You can get adaptive optics on your telescope, but that's very expensive. There's a sort of a poor man's version where you can like hook up uh, webcams and video cams to uh, telescopes to get uh, snapshots of a perfectly still sky, and you can get some pretty darn good images uh, using amateur equipment in ways that just wasn't possible when I was first growing up with my six-inch uh, Criterion telescope. You um, Galileo, right? Yeah, well, I was a, lot, a little bit better in Galileo, but uh, <laughs> not not much. Okay, so. I want to get to some questions. We're running out of time. Uh, Tom Nath Nathy, I, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, has asked the question: uh, Would Enki fall into the same category? And I guess he means as P5, or uh, because this question has been sitting here when we were still talking about P5. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dave. En Enki is uh, close, and uh, in terms of its orbit, uh, it is a comet, however, um, by its dynamics. So. Um, this um, distinction between uh, comets and asteroids is clear-cut 
in the case of P5 and the other objects that we've been talking about, um, Enki is kind of on the fence. It's on the dividing line between, you know, are we sure it's a comet or are we sure it's not um, a comet? And, and you said there was a number that helped you decide that, right? What was it it's called? called? It's called the Tisserand parameter. And the, the trouble... That sounds really cool. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Should be uh, a name of a book. Yeah. Just around well, my next old, band name. It's some <laughs> old French uh, dead guy. So uh, <laughs> the Tisserand parameter for Enki is equivocal because the way that parameter is defined is very, very specific. It assumes that Jupiter has a circular orbit and it doesn't and so on and so forth. So there's kind of a gray zone in between. Enki fits in that gray zone. Awesome. Thank you. That's uh, Thank you for that great question, Tom. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, this one comes from uh, Ian Blaker, I think it is, uh, asking um, how big, when you estimate, it says how big is P5 estimated? I, I guess what that means is um, you already said how big it is, but how did you estimate its size? Uh, just from the brightness. So all, all we can do is look is measure the brightness. And the brightness is affected by the area of the thing, so basically by its radius squared and also by its albedo. And we don't know the albedo. It's never been measured. We probably don't have a way to measure the albedo. And so albedo what, is the reflectivity. Is the re so sorry, the, the, yeah, the fraction of the light that's reflected. Yeah. Like the albedo of the Earth is uh, 0.39, for example. Or the albedo of a blackboard is like uh, point, point 0.08. Um, so what we did was look at neighbors, look at orbital neighbors of this body, and um, uh, we use their albedo. So some of some of the nearby objects have been measured. Their albedo is about 29%, uh, and that's what we assumed. And then we could interpret the brightness in terms of the size of a solid body having that albedo. If it's darker, uh, it will be bigger. And if it's brighter, it will be smaller. But it's probably pretty close to 0.29. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so Andreas... Um Andreas Vosinakis Vos uh, on YouTube is asking Bonnie, um, recent publications in uh, uh, in uh, Astro PH archive, <laughs> archive yeah, thank archive. you. Archive. Uh, focus on two reasons for ison brightening. I've never actually had to say that before. Uh, okay, for two reasons for ison brightening: either uh, exposure of fresh ices to the sun and possible start of disintegration. What do you think, Bonnie? Well, I think that. I, I can't really make up my mind on which one of those it is, uh, but in in the past, this sort of brightening has been indicative of a split, maybe not a full fragmentation, but some sort of uh, splitting or fracturing <laughs> of the overall object, and that exposes new ice, and that stuff starts fizzing away and sublimating and all of that good stuff. So. I don't know. I kind of, part of me wants it to disintegrate because I think it would be really exciting to see with the solar based observatories. Um, all those you little. You want to see ice and die. I want, <laughs> I want to see it disintegrate. <laughs> I've been, I've been uh, in a guilty sense, uh, wishing for it to disintegrate for two reasons. Well, I, I would have liked it to disintegrate in October when Hubble could have done the post mortem because that's what we do best. You know, as you said earlier. We have the sensitivity and the resolution to, to do that. We've done it before. Orbit, but also, I think it's a, an exit strategy for, you know, all the hype of it being the comet of the century. You know, we, we won't have to explain at every holiday party, you know, why it's not living up to the hype if it doesn't. Because it'll be spectacular, but it'll be spectacular in a different way. So I'm actually kind of pulling for it to disintegrate. Yeah, it's funny. I think uh, a lot of astronomers who study these things are kind of hoping that the thing uh, falls apart. It's uh, a little bit uh, sadistic, but um, yeah, well. <laughs> what a morbid okay. bunch of people we got. Yeah, here. what's up with that? <laughs> what's up with that? Um, so there was a Godiva seven seven two one comments on YouTube. I must say I agree with your statement, Dr. Jewett. I think uh, they're referring to uh, the, the the Hubble discretionary time and the amount of uh, discoveries that are being done there. So I, I think that's what that's in reference to. Scott, do you have anything you want to pull and point out from the yeah. uh, event page for me? Yeah, I do have a few here. Heidi Kahn from Google Plus. Um, Hi, Heidi. I'm so happy you're here again. I see Heidi all the time. I know she's, she's awesome. A great commenter. <laughs> she is. That could you surmise that the asteroid has always shed jets of material such as we see now? Or do you think it's a new happening? Uh, I think it's it's got to be a new thing because, you know, it's pretty small body. <clears throat> I mentioned we have an upper limit to the size. It's not bigger than 250 meters. 
uh, and simply it can't keep losing mass for that long. So uh, it's either the first time it's done it or it does it intermittently with huge gaps of inactivity uh, in between. I don't know which one it is, but one of the things I want to know is how long will it continue to do this? Is it going to have these mini avalanches, if that's what they are, you know, for another, another few months or another few years? Or maybe it's already stopped. Uh, and so that will be interesting to find out. Yeah, in addition to that question, actually, I was just wondering myself, because we often consider like, the asteroid belt to be very unchanging over long periods of time. Um, I think people have this impression that all these asteroids are very close together, but you know, space is very big if they are very, very, very distant. Is there some sort of statistical analysis of how often these asteroids do suddenly become active, like this example, or how often they collide, perhaps in the, was it the A2 example? I mean, are there any statistical analysis of the number of bodies versus how many times they become active or collide? Yeah, so there are, and they're very rough. So <coughs> in the case of A2, excuse me, in the case of A2, the projectile that we think might have hit the main body uh, was a few meters across, maybe as big as a dining table, something like that. So we don't know how many boulders as big as a dining table there are in the asteroid belt. We don't have a very good way to estimate that. So the, the collision rate is very uncertain. But for a body of A2 size, it's, the time scale is several tens of millions of years. So the only reason you can expect to see one is there are hundreds of millions of bodies like A2. So on any individual one, you've got to wait you know, 30 million years or something for an impact. But you've got so many of them that you have a chance to see one or several at any given time. So the impact rate is probably significant at these sizes. For the other bodies, we can't say much. And the reason is that the surveys, like PANSTARS, um, are not um, quantified. So we don't know how much area of sky has been surveyed uh, accurately to what uh, faintness, what depth, because they just haven't published that properly yet. Uh, oh, if we yes. do that. Yeah. If we knew that, we could calibrate, you know, the discoveries and then say something about the population. And we will plan to submit a target of opportunity proposal for each of the next 30 million years. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Because Hubble's, Hubble's going to be around, definitely. That I'll keep so, practice for it, for sure, for 30 million years. Okay, so let's get to one more question before we have to go. This comes from uh, Cheryl Plonke on uh, Google+, Plus, who is asking, uh, is this leading to anything that could change any historical theories regarding, I think she's referring to P5? Well, it, I think it relates to this um, uh, question of uh, what I always say is how do asteroids die? So the, the traditional view is that the bigger asteroids smash into each other and make smaller asteroids, and they smash into each other and make smaller ones all the way down to dust. But in fact, this YORP process, which operates preferentially on sub-kilometer bodies, might become more important than impact for things that are less than a kilometer across. Interesting. So, so what this might be telling us is that actually YORP really is important, um, and YORP is the fundamental process that creates dust from asteroids and that destroys asteroids. So it might actually be very common, and we've just noticed it uh, really for the first time because our observing is just suddenly good enough to see these things. So that's kind of important. How do asteroids die? Outstanding question. Thank you, Cheryl. And I think with that, we will have to stop because we are running out of time. But um, I want to thank everybody for watching. Uh, Dr. Jewett, uh, Max Mutzler, and M Bonnie Meinke, thank you all for showing up and helping. Ian and Scott, thank you again for helping me out. I hope that Alberto will be able to join us for the next one. He, as most of you know, uh, have has taken another job at, at Northrop Grumman, and so he is busy getting settled into his new digs. And so I hope he will be with us at our next Hangout, which I want to uh, plug now. It's on, uh, on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. It's a little bit earlier because um, uh, Dr. Finkelstein couldn't get it any earlier. He's from the University of Texas at Austin. And we are going to talk about high redshift galaxies, in particular uh, the, the most distant, or I guess they're putting it the farthest, no, they're not saying, earliest was the word they're using, the earliest galaxy uh, ever confirmed. Uh, 
uh, that we know about. Uh, so we're going to we're going to talk with uh, t about that discovery with him. We'll also have Dr. Dan Co on hand from the Space Telescope Science Institute talk about his most distant galaxy at Z equals 11. Dr. Finkel signs at Z 7.5, so it's a little bit closer, but. Um, we're going to talk about what all of this means because what you know who's who's right. What is the most distant galaxy, and what does it mean to be confirmed? So we're going to well that will be on Tuesday, uh, the at three o'clock uh, Eastern time, and we have already got the event out on the the event page. I'll also be tweeting about it and putting it on Facebook. So thank you guys for watching, guys. Thank you all again for being with me. This was an awesome hangout. Thank you guys. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate all it. Right. Thank you, Tony. Okay, and we hope, and Ian, I'm hoping to see you next week too. I haven't, I haven't gotten a confirmation, but yes, I'm awesome, great. I'll be there. Scott, yeah. Scott, Ian, and I will definitely be here along with. I will not be right. here, but I already told you that. Oh, that's I right. I will not be here on Tuesday. That's right. Well, we'll have to do without Scott. I'm sorry to say. It was I know a everyone's early. heartbroken, but <laughs> it's okay. But I will. Scott uh, who? I'll make sure Alberto. Scott who? <laughs> yeah, hopefully we'll have our some, Albert some guy. Okay. Some guy, you know. All right. Well, Hubble huggers, that's it for this time. Thank you for watching. And as always, keep looking up.